And we are live. Greetings and salutations. Guys, welcome for a, of course, a very special stream today because we have Ginny D. Ginny, how Hi. are you doing? Oh, I'm great. I'm having a wonderful Saturday and this is making it even better. Yay! We are so excited to have you coming here today to talk to us, of course, about world building in general and more specifically, costumes, uniforms, outfitting, all of that stuff that people forget about. And uh, yeah, our challenges this year have all been that. Things that people don't do as much as, as maybe you should to like really develop your world. So uh, yeah, would you say costuming is something like that? Oh, absolutely. I think a lot of times, especially people who don't have a lot of experience with like fashion or sewing or design or any of the things that are related to clothes, sometimes it just doesn't even pop into people's heads. They don't even think about it. And I think it's one of those things that um, like in like in movies or TV shows, if they really did think about it, it shows even if you don't notice it, it impacts how full the world feels. And if it's not there or it hasn't been thought about, I do feel like it can make something feel unfinished. Absolutely. And it can take a world from so-so or tropey to something really crunchy or really original. It can add a lot of extra depth and all that good stuff. Um, I would like to introduce Ginny properly, of course, because I have not done that yet. Ginny D <laughs> is a D&D &D creator, singer, cosplayer, YouTuber, extraordinaire. I mean, gosh, you do so much stuff. You it's do original list. character creation. It's amazing. Thank you. Uh, so you've been creating content for quite some years now, right? Yeah, um, I've been I've been cosplaying for ten years this year. This is my ten year anniversary of cosplay, and even before <gasps> that, I did a bunch of bunch of stuff. You know, I started out doing like fan dubs on YouTube when I was fourteen or whatever. Oh so gosh. I've been making stuff a long time. <laughs> That's so cool. Thanks. Um, it's it's been a journey. <laughs> yeah, I could imagine. My God, you must have learned a lot doing all of those different things as well. Yeah, I definitely think that the variety of different things that I've tackled creatively over the years has all come together into what I'm doing today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I feel the same. Obviously, as as I like to describe myself as the argument for multiclassing, and uh, yeah, I definitely feel like all the bits that I do feed into each other as well. So yeah. You are not only one of the loveliest beams in the RPG space, of course, you are also an anvilite. So can you tell us a bit more about how you've been using World Anvil as well? Yeah, so I, first of all, I just want to say world building has always been really kind of scary to me um, and intimidating. And I've often felt like I am not like a good enough world builder to really flesh things out in a in a wide sense. I tend to just more focus down on specific things and then later, it, they end up not being the right things. But that's one of the things I've loved so much about using World Anvil for my characters, for my original characters, is that that's something that I know that I know how to create and something that I do have a lot of in-depth thoughts on. Each of those characters that I create, I create them for a video where you see a small fraction of who they are. But I know so much more about them in my head than what I show in those videos. So World Anvil has been such a cool opportunity for me to just put all of that thought that I've put into these characters, their backstories, their personalities, just little little quirks about them, things that maybe didn't come across in the video. And I get to actually put them down and share them with people who are interested in getting to know those characters more. And just having an organized space to like put all that stuff down on paper has been awesome. And it's just cool to see all of the characters in a little row and get to think about all the things that make them different and unique. Cause I don't get to do that like in a YouTube video. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, we're just really happy to have you as an anvilite, uh, have you, you know, using World Anvil to, to put these amazing characters out into the world. It, it is so awesome. So Jenny, Jenny shares some of her content uh, publicly for everybody and some stuff I think only goes to Patreons. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. I have a Patreon where I do things like I've just started doing stat blocks for my original characters. Oh, that's so cool. Awesome. Yeah. Cause people have been wanting to put them into their own tabletop games, which I think is so yeah. cool. And it's crazy. I, I hear from people, they'll tell me the stories of what my characters have gotten up to in their games. And I love <laughs> hearing that. People, yeah. It's some so of them have died and I'm mourn a little. <laughs> that is very <pretty> sad. <laughs> but they live on in other people's games. One of the things they talk about in game dev circles is, will it survive contact? And I think that is a perfect example of that. That's so good. <laughs> Did not survive contact. Um, 
Okay, so I just I just got a message in the chat from Demetrius, who was uh, doing the octopus stuff in the background, like making sure everything is working. Um, and he says, Ginny's character is about to make an appearance in my campaign that we are currently playing, but he won't tell me which one. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. Just before we get to the questions, folks, uh, Ginny's links are in the chat. You can find her World Anvil. You can find her website that everything is on. And you can also find her YouTube channel where she releases really, really awesome resources, particularly for players to help players think more about their characters, which I think is really, really cool. So you can find all of that on those links. And uh, just to let you know that Ginny is also doing a Kickstarter right now where some of her, I think it's your your pickup lines, right? Your flirty pickup lines. Pickup lines and jokes and insults. They're, they're designed oh, to be mostly for things like vicious mockery or charm yeah. person spells like that that sometimes have verbal components like that yeah so they're and, being right, made into well, we've turned them into cards yeah yeah exactly Let's so they're now like finish that thought <laughs> quick release cards where you can be like wait wait i have something for this your message was an hamster and your father smells of elderberries <laughs> One of my favorite parts about the cards is that um, working with the guys from Unlimited Realms who helped me put the cards together, they yeah. did all of these hilarious little doodles on each card. They've set them up to look like pages from somebody's notebook, like they're taking mm -hmm. notes on, like a bard taking notes on the jokes they're going to make, for example. Oh, cool. And they've drawn these cute little doodles on them. And a lot of them, they add a secondary layer to the joke that that I didn't even, like I gave them lists of jokes and then they went in and just like layered up the jokes with even more in almost like a comic style, which I love. Yeah, that's that's what good design does, right? Like it's it's amazing to work with people who can really collaborate with you and build on the intention and all of that yeah. good stuff. Yeah, and that's actually in its final days. I think it's down to six or seven days left on that Kickstarter right now. So this oh, is wow. like last last chance to next. Last those chance, decks. guys. Very cool. Five days. Says oh, five days. Wow. Thing you okay. can tell that time just flies. <laughs> So um, Stormbrill, no, it wasn't Stormbrill. It was Cordishal says, where is the World Anvil world? If you go to worldanvil.com forward slash Ginny D, that's D-I, Ginny D, then you will uh, find all of her wonderful stuff there. Yes, you will. Uh, I think it's time to jump into costuming, however, because we are running a challenge that you are going to be judging, Ginny, and you, yes. audience, are going to be participating in. So it behooves us all, behoove, yes, I did use that word, to learn more about costuming and uniforms and ways that we can make them cool and interesting and helpful. I have a bunch of questions here. If you guys have questions, then click the flaming anvil underneath the chat window and submit them. We will be answering all the questions at about sort of 45 or so. So uh, yeah, get those questions in and uh, yeah, our woman of wisdom will answer them. But let's start off with a most important question. Why are costumes important for creating characters? Oh man, I mean, I think you hear in, in the real world, you hear people say the clothes make the man is a phrase that's really common. And I definitely think that's true in fiction in a lot of ways too, because our clothing is one of the, it's one of the only ways that we have complete control over how people perceive us. And yeah. because of that, it's something that, it's something that tells something about us that we've chosen. Like it's something that we are deciding to, to teleport to the people around us through our clothes. So I think that um, it says a lot about a person, what they wear. And you, you can see that in some really iconic costuming that we are used to in media. Like if you put, if you put Elle Woods from Legally Blonde next to Lydia Dietz from Beetlejuice, like, you know, that those are two really different people. You can see that in the way that they're dressed. And I think that it, it also gives you automatic ideas in your head about what their personalities are like. And even if it's not true, even if those ideas you have, like in the case of Elle Woods and Legally Blonde, there's this, they play on the whole perception of, of her wearing, you know, pink girly clothes and people thinking that makes her shallow or stupid. And in the end, she's a brilliant lawyer. And I think that kind of thing, even that contrast, it's not possible if you're not thinking about how they look, about the clothes that they're wearing. I think um, beyond just, there's the, there's the normal levels of what clothes tell us. Like if you're wearing a space suit or a nurse's uniform, that tells you something about their job. But beyond that, it, it gives you so many thoughts about what a, how a person wants to be perceived, what they choose to wear. And then also in written fiction or like in a tabletop game where, where it's spoken story, description really helps us visualize things and picture things. If you don't describe what someone's clothes are like in written fiction, then none of us know. We, we might all be picturing something completely different. And that's an area where you can change, you can, you can use a show not tell 
you know, rule to, to try and really, really tell people something about the character in a more subtle way. Yeah, absolutely. I was hoping you would mention show don't tell because uh, in all forms of fiction, uh, show don't tell is a common rule for those who aren't familiar, which essentially says, um, I think it's, it's taken from Chekhov. Is it Chekhov? Who says, don't tell me it's night, show me the moonlight glinting off broken glass or something. Essentially, That's you great. can create so much more evocative uh, description through showing the moonlight glinting off broken glass than just saying, it was night. And it's the yes. same with characters, right? If you want to portray that uh, the, this cult or this faction is really spoopy and scary, don't say, they are bad. Have them stained in blood, you know, like ha have them with really obviously negative symbolism. Like there's so many ways that you can do that. We're, we're going to get into that later. Uh, but just saying they are bad or he cowboy is a very rudimentary way of doing something that you can be so much more creative with, with your costume, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I went to school for writing. I got my bachelor's degree in writing in English oh, cool. with a writing emphasis. And a lot of a lot of what we were just drilling into our heads the whole time in my fiction classes were absolutely it was like find a way to to trust your reader enough to interpret what you're saying instead of feeling the need to just instruct them on what they should be thinking about a character or about a scene or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, clothes are a great way to convey that kind of message. Uh, one of the things you didn't mention, which I think is really interesting about clothes, and this gets us a little bit away from costuming and uniform, but I think is, is really important, is not just what they are wearing, but what condition it's in. Yes. Yeah. And I actually, um, I, I do want to talk about that a little bit later too, because I think that's a <laughs> huge thing. Uh, how, whether or not someone is in if you're in if you're in like very rich expensive fancy clothes and they're in perfect condition that says something about your your social status your class that says something about what kind of things you do and how many items of clothing you own and uh you know whether or not you're expected to do things like walk through a dirty area whereas if you're wearing extremely fancy rich expensive clothes and they're all muddied and tattered something has clearly happened to you that you were not prepared for all of that tells you something about what the character's been through Right, exactly, which gets us to the whole sort of how can the backstory influence what they're wearing, right? Um, yeah. I think there's a lot to be said about how people are in the clothes as well and people's relationship to the clothes they're wearing. It's a very different thing if there's a woman wearing a very revealing top and she's tugging it lower or a, a very revealing top and she's tugging it up. That's yeah. a completely different messaging. If there's a man who's wearing, you know, delicate sleeves and he's moving his hands and very delicate ways to show off the lace as opposed to a guy who's like this thing is so itchy you know again we're seeing a very different relationship between the person and the clothes that they're wearing right yeah uh yeah sorry go ahead. oh I was just gonna say yeah I I think that that's also um a question too of how do the do the clothes seem to suit them or are the clothes like are they fitted are the clothes fitted to the person who's wearing yeah. them I feel like that's a, a great question to apply to any kind of kind of outfit like a soldier who's wearing a uniform that is clearly ill-fitting to him, like that's that can give you an impression of maybe someone who's unprepared or someone who's very young or, or you know, just it can tell you a lot whether or not someone is confident in the clothes or if the clothes fit them or if the clothes seem aligned with their personality. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the clothes and the way that they're worn and the way that they're cut, you know, it, it tells so much about what was intended and what really is happening. Yeah. Just to let you all know that we are running a raffle right now. We are currently raffling off, speaking of clothing and characters, an Eldritch Foundry miniature figurine. Yes, we will give you the coupon if you win and you'll be able to design your own miniature figurine. So exclamation point raffle to take part in that. And uh, oh, you have to be a follower to take part as well. That's the other thing that I always forget to tell you. You have to be a follower to take part. Exclamation point raffle for, to, for a chance to win a miniature figurine. So what are some ways, going back to our interview, that you can incorporate symbolism and elements of your wider world into costumes and uniforms? Because what we're asking our beans to do is not just design the costume for a single character, it's to think about a, a costuming tradition, essentially. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you can go so many different ways with this and you can go very literal, like uh, a very literal example, for example, is like, um, 
like Slytherin and Gryffindor having different color schemes in Harry Potter. Yeah. It's it's a very obvious thing, right? There's school uniforms and they're themed for each house. And that tells you immediately what a character's personality is like or what a certain group is is doing based on what house they're in. Um, and other things like that are uh, like military factions wearing a military uniform. Like if you are in a military faction that wears a set uniform, then you're immediately gonna be able to tell not just which faction that character belongs to, but also things like their rank. Um, and then also like how, I mean, we talked about the condition of the clothes. So if they're very worn, that may show that they've seen a lot of battle, stuff like that. Um, different insignia and stuff. The, mili the military, like I almost said costuming in the military, which proves how much I know about the military. <laughs> <laughs> uniforms, uniforms in the military. They're designed to communicate information about the wearer in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but it can also be a lot less obvious. Like you look at um, the elves in Lord of the Rings, you look at their costuming next to the costuming of say the dwarves in Lord of the Rings and you can immediately tell which group those costumes belong to based not just on um, based on things like like color and even the type of fabric and styles and you have little things like uh, the leaves of Lorien brooches that the fellowship wear those visually tie them to their relationship with the elves who helped them and little things like that um, if you see those leaves those leaf brooches then you know that's connected to the elves so you meet the fellowship and you know that they're allied with the elves that kind of information is very subtly conveyed through stuff like costuming and uniform and i don't know personally i really love when there's good costume continuity in movies or tv shows like one of my favorite examples is in game of thrones and this is hair so it's like costuming adjacent but in game of thrones uh cersei's hairstyle with her like weird roll on top of her head yeah. she's wearing that in the early seasons and when sansa comes to king's landing she starts wearing her hair like that because she has a lot of respect for cersei and she wants to be like her and a lot of other women in the court wear their hair like that because cersei is the queen she's their model but then when marjorie comes to king's landing and starts gaining favor a lot of the women around her including even just background extras in the show start changing the way that they wear their hair to match marjorie Marjorie's hair yeah. and that kind of thing is it says so much about the attitudes at court in a way that's never actually literally voiced but it gives you the impression as you're watching it yeah and, and I, that's the, sorry I was just gonna say no, that's no, go the kind of stuff that not every reader or every viewer will notice but Sable Aradia in the chat is saying I noticed that too for example so some of that not all of that telling that sorry not all of that showing that you're putting out Everybody is going to pick up on everything, but people will pick up on enough of it that actually you're conveying a lot in a very subtle and interesting way. And then people feel like, hey, check me out. I saw that too. I also think it's a it's a reason why you should do a lot of little things like that is you have to you have to trust that some of your readers or viewers will pick up on it, but that not all of them have to in order for it to have an impact. Because yeah. when you do have little things like that happening, even if people don't say, huh, I just noticed something weird about the hairstyles, the existence of those changes and those little nods and tweaks, those make a world feel full, even if you aren't spotting them. They yeah. they make a world feel real. Yeah, absolutely. One of my favorite examples of symbolism in uniforming is from the Star Wars animated series, uh, The Clone Wars, where you have all of these clones and they all have a uniform and it's all the same, except because of course they're all the same as well. So it's not just the same uniform. It's like literally the same size uniform. Everything is the same. They are clones except they all put like patches and scratches and like personal identifiers on that because they're creating their own identities through their costuming. So on the one hand, it is a uniform that is completely standardized. And on the other hand, there is a whole culture surrounding the individuality that they have created for themselves, that they've almost manufactured for themselves because they are all the same. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I love that. That's so cool. So I think you can really play with this when you're when you're thinking about costumes and thinking about, you know, what is the same for everybody and how do people personalize this? How do they customize it? You know, how do fashions change it through the times as well? You know? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I like <laughs> like I was going to say something and then realized I didn't have anything to add. It was one of those like... <laughs> Breaths with intention. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. So uh, yeah, can you think of some interesting ways, like some interesting 
places or ways to incorporate symbols that you've seen before. So I've mentioned, for example, the symbols of the of the uniform. Are there other ways that you can incorporate like specific symbols? Like we think about religious symbols or, or sort of like a society symbols or something within a costume or a uniform. Yeah, I mean, I think you can even just look at the way that we in our own world use symbols and you can see that as a way that 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 same sort of thing can be brought to life in a in a fictional world. Like, for example, we all know what a cross necklace symbolizes. Like if we see someone wearing a cross necklace, we know that we know what religion that person practices. Mm. And that's something that I mean, I think when you think about like in D&D, how people have holy symbols, I think in some ways that can feel you know, a little on the nose, like, ah, oh, yes, a symbol of their God source of power. But like, it's not really that extreme. We do that. <laughs> we, we do that in our own world. Uh, and you even look at something like the way that, you know, we wear in modern times, we wear graphic tees. We'll wear a logo on our t-shirt. That's like, this is my favorite shoe brand or whatever. Like we, yeah. we telegraph a lot of information about ourselves through symbols like that. Um, and I think you can do that even in non-modern senses in a similar way. Uh, I definitely think like insignia related to, um, like political stances or whatever kind of group you're in, whether that be you know, jewelry or patches, or um, you even see, I mean, I keep going back to Game of Thrones because their costuming is so dang good. Yeah, <laughs> so I mean, like they had the excellent. freaking budget, right? <laughs> yes, but you know, even like there's that there's that cult in Game of Thrones where they literally scarify the mark onto their skin. Like you can go so many different ways to communicate a symbol. And then I also think in terms of literal clothing, like fabric clothing, I love when people incorporate symbols in a subtler way, not so much like here's a here's the patch of the group that you're in, but like um, Katniss, Katniss's costumes in the Hunger Games, I think are a great example of symbolism in costuming because they specifically design her dresses and her clothes to invoke the concept of the Mockingjay. They're literally branding her through like the use of feathers and um, the shape of wings, like the idea of a wing shape and a wing symbol and that kind of stuff. I I think can be can really be utilized to communicate themes yeah absolutely and again like it's it's the same if you want to give hints about your villain in your rpg game as if you want to you know show not tell about your characters or give foreshadowing for what they may become right um these are absolutely things that you can use so we've talked about symbolism and we've talked about um uh, we've we've even touched on color, which I think is another really important thing in costuming. A lot of yes. people, particularly in the medieval world, think that the medieval world was all sepia tones. Now that is absolutely not the case. They had an eye for color. <laughs> and actually, if you read uh, some later stuff, if you read, for example, the diaries of Samuel Pepys from the 17th century, uh, his room was hideous. <laughs> it looked like the inside of a kaleidoscope. It looked like Picasso had thrown up, seriously, bright colors, every, and like, so, like one wall was yellow and then something was pink and then he had like a blue waistcoat and a red tie. Like the color blocking has got nothing on Samuel Pepys' everyday life, right? So uh, it's something, what I'm trying to say is, very excited about all of this, <laughs> is that color is something that a lot of people forget, particularly historically, I think. Yeah, uh, that actually just made me think about how they discovered a while back that Romans, ancient Roman statues used to be painted in bright yeah, colors and people got so upset about it because we're used to them as these pristine white images. And then you see approximations of what they actually would have looked like when painted. And they're, I mean, frankly, to modern taste, like they're garish in a they're lot of gorgeous. ways. Yeah. And I think yeah. that that's, I think that's really interesting. I think like, I, I agree that I think people, when they look back in time, they want to make everything sort of like washed out and gray and brown and, and just sort of like sad. But we have, we've always been as people just like fascinated by color and energized by color. And there's so much that we read into color too. I mean, color symbolism is like, it's, it's practically universal. Like they've done studies that if you have a woman in, uh, in black clothing versus a woman in red clothing, that people will perceive the woman in red as more attractive, even if it's the same woman, like that kind of stuff is, it has a really strong hold on us. I think color is, I mean, when you're talking about symbolism, like color is a huge part of that. Even you look at something like I mentioned before, the, the Harry Potter houses, like that has been so ingrained into our consciousness as fans of that series that now it's like people see something in red and gold and they're, they're like, oh, it looks like a Gryffindor thing. Even if it's, I don't know, like a mug or like, you know, curtains, even if it's completely unrelated. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and again, that can change culturally from space to space. Like everybody who knows Harry Potter will be like, oh my God, it's Gryffindor curtains. And somebody else might be like, oh my God, these are the colors of my religion or these are the colors of my football team or something. I remember wearing yeah. a, a pink and I had a pink and black shirt. And uh, one of the school, one of the kids in the school where I used to teach went, oh my God, Palermo FC. And I was like, it's not. But that is, There's they are reason. the colors of Palermo FC, right? I changed my hair to green in October because I like to wear orange for Halloween and my hair is blue and our local football team is the Broncos and they're, they're orange and blue. So literally if I wear orange and my hair is blue, people are like, go Broncos. And I'm like, I can't relate to you. <laughs> yes, go Broncos over there. Off you go, trot, trot. <laughs> Yay, sport. Yay! Go go with the sporting. Yeah, no, I I am in the same place. I if you like sports, that's awesome. You can like sports. It's not for me. Demetrius in the chat says, like, "Greeks did it first, by the way, with the painted statues." Just to be clear, uh, just so we are, you know, representing my my home country as we should be. Um, and I think that segues very nicely from color into materials and fabrics because not only are they very evocative um they can tell a lot about the status of a person and their lifestyle you don't wear silk at a construction site you don't wear leather in a well i was gonna say you don't wear leather in a ballroom but i've seen some ballrooms and <laughs> things uh, i've seen things guys um but also fabric changes the way that um pigment can be absorbed right so it necessarily gives you a different effect anyway yeah, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about fabric types because I think it's one of those areas that people who have never done any sewing often have no insight into. And yes. it can end up resulting in sometimes, uh, like you'll read something and someone will describe a fabric that they clearly just like Googled and, and they're not right about it. And it can be, it can really throw somebody who understands that kind of thing out of a, of a world uh, because I think that it, it can just demonstrate like that you're not, you're not communicating what you want to communicate if you aren't, if you aren't like aware of what, how those things translate. For me, I think the main thing, I think you're totally right that they, that they treat color differently. But for me, I think the main thing I think of when I think of fabric type is about, is about weight and drape and flexibility because there is such a huge difference between, like if you imagine a, a brown dress made out of burlap versus the exact same pattern made out of satin, those are two completely different dresses. And they tell you completely yeah. different things about the people. And they're different to wear. Uh, obviously wearing a burlap dress would suck. That would be very itchy and uncomfortable. Jeez. Uh, and, but also like it would last longer, it would have more durability. Like you, you know, there are different circumstances where you would wear such a dress. I, mean, I don't actually know that anyone would ever make a dress out of burlap on purpose, but regardless. Oh, oh no, they, they're so actually that's super interesting. Uh, using things like burlap or hessian or rough fabric. This is traditionally things that you did in um, like when you dress in sackcloth, right? So in the yeah. Bible where it's like, oh, you have to dress in sackcloth. Oh People yeah. That was a whole thing. So, you know, somebody sitting in the audience who's like, oh, I don't know what to write about. That could be something like write about the thing that you wear that is supposed to be uncomfortable because it makes you, it reminds you of whatever it is. So people yeah. who were shamed or people who were uh, in mourning, they would wear these intentionally uncomfortable clothes. I think John the Baptist wore a shirt made of camel hair. Yeah, to say hair shirt Bible. is what I've mostly yeah. heard of. As Super freaking itchy, right? Yeah. Like, Ur! but there's a reason he's wearing it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, obviously a lot of fabrics communicate um, how expensive they are, uh, like the weave, the material, the color, all of that can communicate wealth, the wealth of the wearer. Um, and then I personally, as a costumer, I'm really interested in fabric movement because mm. if you have something very stiff that holds its shape, you can create very structural garments with it. Um, you know, a standing collar or something that has very clean lines, something that's sort of like a uniform is more likely to be out of a fabric that, that has a, a stiff texture to it. Whereas if you have something like chiffon that's super lightweight and very flowy. It has a lot of movement. It can drape in very beautiful ways, but also that's a very fragile kind of, kind of fabric. Like that's something that if you're going to wear it, it's like, it's going to tear. I made a silk chiffon shirt and the number of little snags that it's gotten after being worn to three photo shoots slash conventions. I mean, you'd have to be really rich to wear clothes like that all the time because they get damaged and they can't 
really be fixed once they're not very easily once they're damaged like that. I think those kind of questions are really important to ask yourself if you're going to define what fabrics things are made out of. Like a character who does a lot of manual labor or a character who's in combat a lot or who does a lot of travel, they're going to wear something sturdy because it's going to have to survive all the things they're doing. Whereas like a like a rich fancy noble, they're going to wear something that's designed to be worn while like reclining in an expensive room. And then if they wear those things on an adventure, it's going to reflect what they've been through. That fabric is going to be damaged and impacted and changed by their experiences. And describing that can give you insight on on what someone's been through before they're even on the page, which I think is really cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The other thing, of course, to remember is that um, uh, th- you, you have to wash stuff, right? So yeah. stuff that doesn't wash well is functionally disposable. Um, and this, is, if you're writing in a, in a pre-dry cleaning age, in a pre-sonic shower age, for example, right, you have to remember that some of this stuff can't be washed and just has to be thrown away. This is something that pops up in Jane Austen, where you know uh, a girl buys a, buys fabric for dress, and, and a woman's like, "Oh yeah, I don't think it'll wash well. You were silly to buy it. It's not economical, right?" And it's it's one of those like practicality versus whimsy moments where you learn about the two characters because one of them's like oh it won't wash well and she's like oh but it's got little glossy spots on it I like it so much um yeah. it's just a, it's just a small example of like a, a much bigger space that you can go into as well no oh, absolutely well and I I definitely think um describing what a describing how a costume or an outfit looks in terms of like whether it's sun bleached or whether it's like muddied or whether it's torn and has been patched or darned and stuff like that those kind of things I think are the are the little details that are really going to communicate something about a character and even if it's something like oh you know she like took off the dress and then a maid took it off to you know be made into napkins or whatever you know like whatever's next yeah, for that yeah dress. exactly once it can't be worn as a dress anymore like those kind of thoughts like that that is just like so there's so much story included in each little element of an outfit that based on like its reusability and its its condition and where it came from you know like how it was created and how long it took to even get into the hands of the person who's wearing it yeah. There's an amazing bit in Memoirs of a Geisha in the book. Uh, I haven't seen the movie, but in the book, uh, the the uh, the girls are brought out and they they undo the kimonos for summer or for winter, right? Because they have they have them by season, and they pull them out. And they're all absolutely stunning, and you absolutely get the impression that the kimonos are far more important and valuable than the girls who are wearing them. And that is the that is the moment that you understand that these girls are cheap disposable commodities, but they are wearing art. Yeah, it's amazing as a sort of character drawing moment, you know. Yeah, so good. Great. And it's such a great way to, you know, again, it's, it's the opposite of what you said, where the lady whips off the dress and she's like, oh, give that to Mrs. Miggins to, to you know, pass on to the right. court or whatever. Um, <laughs> You know, to have to have this thing where, you know, you're wearing art, but you yourself can be disposed of tomorrow. Like you're worth nothing. Right. Yeah. Amazing. Well, really. and I know I keep going back to Game of Thrones, but there's that whole okay. scene where Marjorie wears a beautiful, like fancy ladies dress into the poor area and she's stepping in the mud and her, her retainers are like trying to stop her, trying to like hold up her skirts. They're like, you'll ruin your dress. And we as viewers are supposed to see that she is prioritizing these poor people that she wants to help over her own clothes. But at the same time, it also serves to separate her from the people that she's seeing because you're still forced to realize like her clothes are more expensive than these people's lives. Like the people around her want to prioritize her clothing over these, these like poor citizens and it I in my opinion it colors my own opinion of Marjorie like on a subtler level below just the oh it's so nice that she's willing to risk her dress it's also like man the fact that she has to be like oh no I'll risk the dress like that still says something about her too and her level of privilege yeah Yeah, absolutely absolutely because you know that there's 10 more of them hanging in a wardrobe somewhere right exactly she can can afford to do it Yeah, yeah exactly um so how can material and fabric change? No, I've asked you that one, sorry. Um, what are some materials you'd like to see used more, for example? So I don't know if I have like actual physical materials that I'm like, boy, I sure do wish people would use more vinyl or whatever. But I think that what I would really love to see in costuming is less of a less of a focus on um, 
I was just talking with my friend Kelsey about this, about how fantasy often pulls from the same like one or two eras of like mainly European history. And when yeah. you're looking at historical clothing and historical design, there's just such a amazing wealth of ideas out there that I think a lot of times we're not pulling from because we just have this one attitude of like what historical means. And also often we aren't looking at real history. We're looking at whatever pop culture has told us history looks like. Absolutely. Um, there's a YouTuber named um, Carolina Zabrowska who has a great video where she's, <sighs> do you, you love her? I love her. her. She's I love her. She's amazing. She, she has a great video where she's pretending to be uh, multiple women who are sitting around brainstorming costumes for a historical film. And one of the characters says, well, she, you know, they should be wearing caps over their hair because in this time they all wore caps. And the other women at the table just like laugh her out of the meeting. They're like, she's not wearing a cap. And the reason why is that even though historically women for a long period of time in, in Europe wore, wore caps to cover their hair. We don't think that's sexy now. Like yeah. we just don't, in a modern perspective, we just like don't find that attractive. And so we're like modifying what we see as historical based on what we want to visualize on screen. But I think if we were more willing to actually dig into like real historical styles that maybe we haven't seen on screen that much, they would look so much more unique and they would give us so much more to work with. Just such, yeah. such interesting concepts that we have so far just not explored because, because we're cowards. <laughs> right. Exactly. But also because, you know, people, people in film, particularly, you know, they, it, people, people want to make the thing that is like the, the most attractive, the, the lowest common denominator, but our, yeah. our privilege is that we are creating for the audience who loves our stuff. Right. We're not creating for everybody. We're creating for the people who love what we do. So we can take risks like that, right? And also in yeah. a book, if you're like, she wore a hat, people aren't going to be like, oh, well, I don't think she's sexy anymore because it's not <laughs> film, right? Like, it's yes. going to be weird like that. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, uh, my sister is a medievalist and she's consulted for some some stuff like this before. And she, she said things and they've been like, hmm, that's interesting. We think that's it looks better this way. We're going to yeah. ignore that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and you can, I, I, I know a lot of historians and medievalists and archaeologists who have consulted and uh, filmmakers are much more concerned generally with what looks like the other medieval movies than that, what yeah. looks like the medieval period. And I think you're absolutely right that there's so much to dig into there, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And especially if you move outside of just like the narrow little slice of Europe that we've decided is important. Like if you look at other cultures, clothing, there is so much just like fascinating, really unique, really underutilized just concepts out there that a lot of us like don't even think about because we have such a narrow perspective of what fashion is or what clothing looks like. Yeah, absolutely. As Extremsy says, if you're wearing a helmet, you're basically a red shirt. <laughs> 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 so um what are some items of clothing that you'd love to see get more love um obviously you know people people like tend to target specific things and forget other things yeah so i i don't know that i would have had a very strong feeling about this until fairly recently but i have a friend who does hat making and mm. learning more about her craft like seeing how like how the the hat making process is different from any other accessory or clothing or sewing like there are specific tools used in millinery and like specific techniques that are that are pretty much wholly unique to that whole art form and uh i don't know i just would love to see i'm actually a little bit grouchy that we don't use fancy hats very much in modern fashion just because i think it's so cool and it's so much real estate to work with design wise like the the extreme styles that you can put on hats I it just makes me a little bit sad that we don't really use them very much and I would love if they were just represented more both in both in our own modern current fashion but also in fiction and in media just because a hat is like a hat can serve a purpose or a hat can just be like this canvas for artistic expression that can go in so many different ways in different directions and I love that about them yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as you mentioned, people wore hats most of the time. So much. An awful lot of history because they couldn't wash a lot and their hair was kind of gross. So um, that was <laughs> one of the many reasons for wearing hats. Um, you know, hats, uh, things like scarves, dimity scarves, all of these kinds of things, you know, people, they were worn for a huge amount of time. Uh, for me, it's things like gloves. Mm -hmm. People always forget about gloves. Everybody's got their hands out. And again, people wore gloves 
a lot because, you know, touching people with your actual hands was a little bit crass. Um, so yeah, like gloves was just kind of a thing that you did. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I love using gloves in costuming just because I feel like they can they can really change just like the vibe of a costume really easily. Yeah. Like a good fitted leather glove just looks so badass to me. Yeah. And like a really fancy, like delicate lacy glove is like so feminine and so pretty. There's just like so much you can do with gloves. Yeah, absolutely. And it also draws attention to the postures of the hand as well. So like you, yeah. you pay much more attention to that kind of like... Um, gesticulation the you know what they used to call um it's completely gone oh my god I just had like a <laughs> hole in my brain sorry <laughs> so historically whenever you were performing in this is like in the 17th or 18th century you didn't act realistically you acted with the uh, sort of preformed gesture oh, uh, right. and this sort of codified gesture if you wear gloves is, is really highlighted so you see a lot more of of what people are sort of basically subtexting it's like these are your subtext that gives like more information about how you feel about stuff. I love that. That's so cool. It's, it's a whole fascinating bit of, of performance history that's now largely lost, sadly. But uh, yeah, really cool. Uh, like wigs in ancient Egypt, beauty, but also hygiene, says Stiltis. Mm, yeah. Yeah, wigs yeah. are a, another thing people don't really dive into so much, right? Yeah, I was going to say, that's a great point because I think I, I've, I can... I feel like there's certain periods of history where I'm used to seeing wigs in media, like um, like I just 18th recently century. watched. Yeah, and, and I was just re recently watching. Um, crap, I can't remember the name of it now. It's about the it, it's about the Russian. Uh, sorry, I'm just like Anna Karenina. Maybe no, it was no. a it was it was uh it was wasn't it Dakota Fanning? Maybe I'm just gonna look it up really quick. I think Google foo. Wait, maybe it wasn't. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I don't know anything. Anyway, the point is that uh, there was a whole plot line in place about women wearing wigs wrong because they had come from, they were like English fashion and they had heard that they were popular, but they were wearing them like set back on their head and in a different oh, color. Yeah. So you could see their own hair and then you could see the wig hair. And it became this thing where they all thought it was very fashionable that they wore their wigs like that. And then someone who was actually from England was like, you're wearing them wrong and you should all be embarrassed. No. And that kind of thing, like, that's another example, a great example of how you can use something like like local fashion uh, to talk about to talk about how different characters behave or, or what they're going for. Because if you have local fashion that's been trans transported into a different place, they might have a completely different understanding of what that fashion is and wearing, oh yes, the great, L fanning. Thank you, sorry. Yes, the great, it was about Catherine the oh, Great. Oh, Catherine the Great, of course, mm -hmm. yeah. If it's, yeah. Called, and if it's, it's great. called The Great. Fabulous show, beautiful nice. costuming, and a Amazing. great little plotline about wigs as a part of as a part of the social interaction. There we go. Uh, well, my chat knows all about elven shoes and how they can either help or hurt. This is an in, in joke. This uh, how they can either help or hurt your world building. So uh, yeah, think about items of clothing that you might not think about, um, and also feel free to invent your own items of clothing as long as you describe them. Right? You can have a cloak. You can have a shirt. Or like me, you can have something in between. Uh, like there's a, there's a lot of ways that you can go, right? You don't have to just be like, okay, they're wearing trousers and a t-shirt. Um, you can invent something something that is your own if you want to. They did well. that in Shadow and Bone. They invented the clothing of the Grisha is, is the kefta, which is a completely, as far as I can tell, a completely fantasy invented garment. And now it's like, that's the thing that they all wear. And when I know a bunch of cosplayers who are working on costumes from the show now, and they're like, I'm working on my kefta. Like that's an invented piece of clothing that now is a part, just a part of the world enough that people can casually use it to refer to the clothes. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a great way to uh, to to you know really signal signal that this is a different space. Um, yeah. So oh blimey, I just saw the time. I've had so much fun talking with you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to get into specifics now, very quickly. What's your favorite character outfit, and why do you like it so much? Anything, movies, TV games, video games, whatever. 
So this was a hard one because I feel like many cosplayers have the same handful of dresses slash costumes that really got us interested in cosplay. Like yeah. if you meet a group of cosplayers and you say, how many of you are in love with Katrina Von Tassel's stripy dress from the end of Sleepy Hollow, Sarah's ball gown from Labyrinth, you know, like there are all these dresses like that that are iconic to cosplayers. I think if I had to pick one for me, and I really am a dress girl, I love dresses. I think if I had to pick, I would probably say Padme Amidala's lake dress. It's <gasps> that- beautiful gradient dyed completely backless like just an extravagance of a dress it's simultaneously it's so much fabric but also it's like so delicate and she's so exposed in it I don't know it just to me it's like one of the most inventive and beautiful and evocative dresses I've ever seen on screen and I will make it someday <laughs> Someday. I did a photo shoot years ago for an opera um, in which I wore this like hand dyed silk thing. I was playing a, a I was playing a character called the Woman in the Moon, who was basically an Ooh. alien, right? But um, but a hot alien, I was told. <laughs> uh, and I had like silver foil on my face, like all here on one side, and this massive dress. Um, and as I was walking around, I was literally like, "Do not touch the dress. Do not breathe too much, or you'll like." The back will open up. Do not do this. Do not do that. Oh my God. <laughs> Absolutely terrifying. So yeah, having, having been in one of these like hand-dyed silk gradual, graduated, this was somebody's master's project, right? That oh had, been, God. had been made for this. Oh my, it was, a, it was a whole thing. So yeah, for me, it has to be Maleficent. I thought the Ooh. work they did with Maleficent was at, with the hat, with the thing, with the oh, way yeah. it kind of melts. Um, and and the the just every I thought it was so seamless and yeah. such an iconic costume, like you and know if you sorry go ahead sorry no no you go I interrupted you I'm no so excited about Maleficent. I was just gonna say like all you need to do is glance at her to be like this woman is evil and I love her do you know what I mean they captured it so well and I love how I mean there's a challenge to to translating a cartoon costume into reality in a way that doesn't feel flat and I think yeah. they really nailed it with that and actually I mean I feel I know that you're going to ask me about my least favorite costume and it's an example of translating a cartoon costume to reality in a very bad failed way but Maleficent okay, is so like good. the opposite of that yeah I mean I and I'm not I'm not the only person I'm like everybody hates this dress but mm -hmm. Belle's gold ball gown in the in the live action Beauty and the Beast movie is a disaster and it makes me furious to this day it just <laughs> Like they they pulled so much direct historical influence for that movie. And then to have all of these like beautiful, elaborate, like clearly historically influenced costumes on the extras around them. And then to put Emma Watson into like a modern yellow prom dress. I've just oh. seen it. It made me so mad. And other costumes for her in that movie are great. Like her blue dress is beautiful. I think they did a great job on that. There's a ton of texture. They've added a little bit of color variance into it. The yellow dress, they just, I don't know, they just failed. It, yeah, it looks like a mop has a love affair with a tub of margarine. It's horrible. <laughs> It's I really hate, bad. I mean, even if I didn't hate the shape, which I do, I hate the shape. I hate, I hate everything about it. But but on top of that, even just the color by itself, like I think when you watch the cartoon Beauty and the Beast, you know it's supposed to be gold. Like it's the only it's the only yeah. flat color in the movie that is highlighted, like that has yeah. highlights on it. And it's yeah. because it's supposed to, like you're trying to translate gold, and if you if you just translate gold into a flat color, it looks like brown. And I and I get it. So like they made it yellow to tell you gold. So then to turn it into a yellow dress is like oh it makes me so annoyed it yeah and so it's beautiful. supposed to match the gold on the cuffs as well so it looks like that they go together because of the whole like and that's the other thing you could do right with costuming right you can be like this character is clearly meant to go with this character look yeah they both have the same favorite color they're both they they've got something matching that's a really nice way to foreshadow like particularly in a romance or if you want to do um if you want to do, uh, I don't know why this is siblings, but the siblings now, if you want to do siblings, you could, it's a nice way to showcase, to give them similarities between, right? There's no yeah, reason yeah. they're not wearing a uniform, but they're still both wearing blue, right? And that gives you something. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's your least favorite. What's the silliest or most unrealistic costume you've seen? So I don't know if I have like one in particular that sticks out to me, but I will say that it has always bugged me in like action or superhero concepts when they wear onesies. Because like, if you've ever worn a full, 
like a like a jumpsuit and then had to pee like you know how uncomfortable it is to be like in a public bathroom basically stripped down to the knees in order to pee and like a superhero is gonna have they're not gonna be able to like take 20 minutes to go pee you know like they're I don't know it just feels so it, it feels insane to me like imagine that you're mid battle and you have to just like peel off all your clothes oh <laughs> terrible Terrible. If if onesie, then nappy. It's not a <laughs> it's not a stylish thing that you want to be thinking about. I'm guessing. Well, this is something I think that cosplayers can really bring to the table in these kind of conversations because we aren't just designing or thinking about these clothes. We're actually making and wearing them. And when you wear them, you learn what's inconvenient or or what doesn't make sense about a costume design because you have to like wear it to a convention. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, my favorite example of that actually is um you guys know i used to be an opera singer i used to wear a lot of costumes i used to do a lot of performance um when you wear these massive skirts like the full crinoline hoop five feet wide at the base you look like an inverted dreidel all right and you're sort of wandering around if you meet another lady who is also like this you can't talk to each other quietly because you're too far away and if you get closer your your ends go like go like that and like sort of pan out from each other and you end up with like like tulip behind you right um that. it completely changes the way that you can interact with other people people can't physically get close to you like they have to stop at the perimeter i'm not even kidding um <laughs> and yes you do feel like you are a wandering you know marshmallow float whatever but it also really changes the way that you can interact with other people. It, it creates this distance. It creates this, you know, rarefication essentially where people can't come and whisper in your ear because if they do that, then your dress is swinging this way, right? You're gonna hit somebody in the face over there. Um, so it, like, it, it really can make a huge difference. For me, the other one is that in the 18th century, sleeves were sewn to here. Oh, so, so you can't lift your arms. put their arms up. Mm. And dancers used to have special costumes, female dancers, where they could get the um, their their arms like up to here so that they could dance. Because usually a wow. woman could only get their arms up to here, so oh everything was all very like this is the movement that you do. You can't you can't do that. You can only do this stuff. So it's it's a really interesting space. It's all completely different. But no woman's gonna like put her arms up like this if if they put a gun in your face because if they do that, the whole sides of their costume are gonna rip. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. Okay. Demetrius is yelling time in the chat, which <laughs> means that it's time to answer your questions. Let's have a look at what you are talking about. Um, do you think an outfit should be made to describe the wearer, something giving the general outline at first glance and providing so much information in the next days or weeks of examining? Wait, I'm sorry. Can you do it? Can you say it again? So I didn't I quite follow. <laughs> It's, 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 it, th 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 there, there is some, yeah, yes, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, I think what Stiltis is asking is, um, can you use outfit only at first glance or can you use it to provide information over time? I mean, I definitely I mean. think, I, I definitely think it can be both things. I think that, um, first of all, I think costuming slash outfit slash clothes is an absolutely, really key part of a first impression, like a first impression image, because before you even talk to someone, you can see what they're wearing. And because of that, I think it's really useful as a storyteller, as a way to communicate things right off the bat. And your other characters will make assumptions based on what someone's wearing, because that's how we navigate the world, you know? Yeah. But I also think that the kind of stuff that we've been talking about throughout this stream, like the, the, the details and the little things that come out over time, like, um, uh, actually, an example that I can think of right off the top of my head is at the end of Chicago, when uh, Roxy and um, Velma meet up again, Velma has just finished an audition. And at one point she bends down and Roxy sees that her fishnets are torn. And that's something that when she first spotted Velma, she didn't see that. That was something mm -hmm. that Velma was concealing. But the further that their interaction goes on, the more she's able to notice something like that, that tells her, oh, Velma's mm -hmm. struggling. Like she's not succeeding right now. And that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, like uh, things like that, like damage, that kind of stuff very well could come out over time and tell you more about someone over time, the more that you can examine their clothing or see or see what they're wearing. 
Yeah, absolutely. And of course, I mean, if you meet Indiana Jones one day, you'll be like, oh, dude's wearing a hat. If you meet Indiana Jones every day for a week and you're like, wow, that dude does not take off that hat. <laughs> yes. Right? Like it starts to give you not just what changes, but what remains the same. Absolutely. Or, I met him every day and he had a different colored shirt for every day of the week. That tells me a lot about this guy. Like yeah. fashion is very important to him. Change maybe is very important to him. It doesn't have to say one specific thing. It could be evocative of a, a variety of things, but it's definitely telling me something, right? Yeah. And those are the clues that your, your reader is going to put together over, climb, over time as well. So great question, Stiltis. Um, how would a costume or set of clothes tell something about the society it is carried in? Very good question, World Key Master. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think we can see a lot of really good examples of this in media too. Like, um, you know, in the in the world of the Hunger Games, for example, you see that a lot of people are doing, they're wearing crazy things in the big city because that's the fashion of the big city. And for someone like Katniss, who comes from a small town where she wears like stuff that we would wear today, you know, like basically just pants and a leather jacket and a scarf because it's kind of cold. They're durable clothes. They're not very flashy. They're there for a purpose. And then when she comes to the big city and sees um, sees all of these people after her time in the arena, she sees all these people wearing extravagant, crazy, difficult to move in. Uh, they're very, you, you would absolutely see them if you were out in the forest. A deer would run away from that dress, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. I think that tells you that Katniss's culture that she comes from is practical and it's uh, it's rural. Like they they are using their clothes as tools to navigate their world in a different way than people in the city are using clothes as as social or political tools to navigate their world. Whereas hers is being used as camouflage or protection or whatever. They serve different purposes. Yeah, absolutely. I think if you look at something like Victorian England as well, that's another great example where you see all the women, regardless of class, they have all of, they have everything is up to here, right? Like there's no, there's not even a collarbone is shown and everything's all the way down to the ankle on the other extreme. Lots of long sleeves, women are very covered up. A lot of women are wearing hats. Uh, and uh, that's very telling. This is a society where covering your body, particularly as a woman, is very important. You have to be modest. That is a virtue. So um, I think that's another thing. If people are wearing like, very covered up or you know if everybody in all societies is wearing the same like a cross necklace for example that tells you that this is a society where everybody is religious it's not just the priest it's not just the upper class for example everybody has a cross necklace whether it's made of wood or whether it's made of gold right yeah so i think that's another really really good way to do that and to convey a lot of societal norms in a very, very beautiful, showy, not telly way. Yeah. Um, great question. <laughs> hey, it's AP says, I kind of want an anvil necklace now, our holy symbol of world building. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I freaking love that. Love that. Um, M. M. Holt says, what about fictional materials? How do you recommend people hmm. approach developing something for their world which doesn't exist in ours? That's a great question because we see fictional materials used a lot in, um, I think especially in like armor and weaponry, it's really common, mm -hmm. uh, like fictional metals and stuff, because you can create something that has unusual properties. Uh, but you could absolutely do the exact same thing with a fabric or with a fiber, uh, especially like if you have a world where there are a completely different set of plants, you've created your own plants, then the fibers that you make fabric out of are going to be different than the fibers that we use, because our fabrics are made out of plants on Earth. So if you if you want to change that, if you have different plants, a different planet, um, or even like, let's say that you have a world where you don't have access to plants they don't grow things you know maybe you live on a space station and you can't grow plants to be fibers then you just end up with you end up with a completely different place that your fabrics are coming from and you can think about that in the way that you the way that you talk about them and saying like oh this is a fabric that like let's say that you're in space and they design a fabric that prevents certain toxins from getting to your skin or whatever based on the world that you're on you can go all kinds of places with that kind of thing yeah, absolutely. Um, when we were doing a plants challenge, which was our previous challenge, this is something that we touched on a lot because of course, most of the fabrics that we have for present day come from plants. Um, there was a really cool example from Cobalt Press, which was a, a, a giant abolith dude uh, who lived in the Underdark. So he had a loincloth made of mushroom fabric. 
which is actually something that scientists are working on right now. Like that's something that's that's starting to come now is people Ooh, making fabric that. from mushrooms. But I always wondered what would happen if it goes into the rain? Like, is it going to start sprouting, right? Like, it's so cool. Like there's so many cool things that you could then do with that, you know? Yeah. So uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of very interesting things you can do with fabric. Um, remember, of course, as well, that you can have in a magical world, you can have fabric which is bewitched. And in a technological world, you can have fabric which is enhanced. So uh, yeah, don't feel you have to limit yourselves to, you know, wool, cotton, and leather. You're world builders, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wordy Girl is complaining about pan uh, pockets in women's pants. Oh, oh yes. my God, please. Yes. Please give, please give women pockets in your fiction. Let us live, let us live a good and helpful life in fantasy, if not in reality. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, what do you think is the best way for writers to use costume materials in their worlds? As in fabric choice for clothes, jewel choice and metal choice, etc. asks Princess Honey Tea. Yeah, I mean, I think I definitely think that it's a decision that each each writer is going to make on their own based on the way that they use description in their world. Because, um, for example, there are there are written pieces out there where people describe everything. They describe every every food item on a plate on a table at a feast. They describe you know every fiber of of what someone is wearing. And then there are other pieces where people don't usually do much descriptive stuff like that. They focus more on the actual activity on the page. And I think that if you're the former and you include a lot of description, then you have you have so much to play with in terms of costuming and materials and stuff like that. You can choose to really dig into that kind of stuff and, and show off some interesting and unique angles on the, the characters and your world. But also if you're, in, if you're one of the latter and you are usually more minimalist with your description, I think that that's a really good opportunity to be very particular about what you do choose to, to say about a material. Um, like if you choose to describe the fabric that something's made out of and you're not a George R. R. Martin kind of writer, then that means something. It, it really has extra weight on that descriptive choice that you've decided to talk about the fabric. Uh, and I, I'm like, I tend to be less on the like deep description side and more on the picking the right picking the right few details and just staying focused on those. And I always find that that's most effective when you don't describe the things that are obvious or, or that are assumed. You describe the things that are really unique and that stand out because then you have an opportunity to just take that one little piece and say, oh, whatever you were thinking or assuming about this character, here's something that challenges that. That's really awesome. Uh, Elinda Play says, any books or resources on fabrics and their specific usage that you can recommend? Ooh, I really wish that I had a tip like that because I am sadly, shamefully under educated in like actual costume and clothing and fashion and history. Uh, a lot of what I've learned, I've just learned online and I've picked up in places from, from having friends who know way more about historical costuming than me uh, and from stumbling across the right YouTubers and videos and stuff. Um, I would say that if you're really interested in particularly in historical costuming, then uh, you should really check out your library. I know that we don't go to libraries so much anymore, some of us, but a library is like, they're going to, first of all, they're going to have a ton of resources for you to pick from and you can explore them while you're there so you can see if it has what you want. But better yet, historical costuming, you it doesn't need to be a modern book to have good information in there. So you can you can take advantage of literally hundreds of years of research and education on historical costuming in a library. It might be a harder place to find information about a more recent topic. You know, you're not going to go to the library to find like a book on Bitcoin. But if you want to learn about historical costuming, lots of resources there. Yeah, absolutely. And remember, folks, you can also request books from your library. And uh, depending on where you are, they may be able to get them for you. So if you go in and say, give me your books on historical costuming, and they say, uh, we don't have any, then you may be able to request them as well, either from other libraries within the network or to be bought, because libraries do get funding to, to buy new books, right? Like, that's also a thing that happens. Uh, just a reminder that we are just about to close that raffle. So exclamation point raffle to take part to win an Eldritch Foundry miniature figurine, which you can dress yourself to your heart's content. Oh yeah, you see what I did there. We have a question about cosplay. So it seems that Soup Scribbles is going to be doing their first cosplay this summer as Yay! a tiefling 
monk. So first of all, congratulations. You're brave. Very, very impressed. Any advice on cosplaying tieflings or on cosplaying in general? Absolutely. So first of all, I think it's awesome to be going into cosplay with an original character because you have so much freedom and flexibility there and you can pick things that you think will be flattering on you or are things that are within your realm of possibility to craft. You can decide where you want to challenge yourself and where you want to do things that you feel more comfortable with. Um, I think that's a great place to start because you get so much flexibility. Uh, as far as cosplaying tieflings, I will say having cosplayed quite a few tieflings and a lot of a specific single tiefling. Um, the main things with tieflings are horns, tail, and then an unusual skin color. And all of those things can be challenging, uh, especially if you're new to cosplay. I will say that in terms of um, an unusual skin color, first of all, you shouldn't feel like an extreme pressure to body paint yourself if that stresses you out, or if that seems outside of your, your realm of comfort, um, or even just if you think you'll be uncomfortable because body paint is not super comfortable. So you can also just totally be a human colored tiefling if you want to. There's no rules. You can make that call. But if you do, I like to use Mehron Paradise. It's a water uh, water activated paint. So it's really just like a kind of a cakey, a little bit dry version of foundation. And then I usually wear, um, I make long gloves out of tights and I wear tights and I glue fake fingernails onto the gloves so that you don't actually have to paint your arms and legs, which saves you ton of paint, ton of time, and it makes it so you can hug people without danger. I was going to say, saves you from transfer. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, also, onto then, like everything of your costume, right? Because it's, yeah. it's brutal. It gets everywhere. Yeah, wearing, wearing Jester, who is blue, a blue tiefling, with a white shirt is like, how do you not get blue all over it? And the answer is that you don't paint these parts of you. You just paint this part of you. And then horns wise, uh, a, a tip that I've only recently started using is I've uh, started using really strong magnets, rare earth magnets. You can either stitch the magnets into your wig or you can put them on a headband and then you can put magnets on the horns. That, that way, when you inevitably bonk your horns against a doorframe or a lamp, which I do all the time, uh, they are either they're going to stay on or if they fall off, you can very easily reattach them with no very problem. Smart. Yeah. Yeah, and then with tails, um, I like to make a tail out of uh, a foam dowel, which is basically just a really long cylinder of foam, or you can just make a little tube out of fabric and stuff it with like um, like batting, like stuffing for stuffed animals. Uh, and then you can attach it with fishing line to your wrist or the bottom of your skirt or some other part of you so that it ends up having its own, it, it stays raised up off the ground and it gives it a nice little amount of bounce and movement that can make it look really realistic. That's so cool. Sorry, that was a lot of realist, like really very specific tiefling stuff, but that's no, an area no, of expertise no. for me. That's what <laughs> Soup Scribbles asked for. That's <laughs> wonderful. Um, I have a quick question on that regard. Um, I know how it's handled in my world. How do you handle things like photographs? Because I happen to know that if you wear an elaborate costume, there will be people who will ask to take a photograph of you. There'll be people who ask to take the photograph with you. And there'll literally be people just following you around with a camera like this. Yeah, I mean, as a cosplayer, I've gotten really used to people just taking pictures of me even when I don't want them to, like while I'm eating lunch or while I'm half out of costume. <laughs> it's frustrating, but like it's something that kind of comes with the territory. I do think in general that the most, the best etiquette around cosplay photography is that people ask before they take a photo and that if they want to be in the photo with you or they want to interact with you in some way that they tell you that and get your consent before they do it. Um, like this doesn't happen to me much anymore, but in the early days of cosplay, there were definitely times when someone was like, can we get a picture together? And then they would like grab me or like try and kiss my cheek or something, which is like, Ugh. but I will say that if you are wearing a costume, I do think that if you're wearing a costume in public, there is a certain amount that you just have to accept that people are gonna treat you differently and they're gonna pay attention to you because like you're wearing a costume in public. And I do think it's a good idea to just, like accept that and wrap your brain around it and be like, yeah, somebody might take a photo of me at a gas station and like, that's life. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's just a point I wanted to bring up because uh, obviously when I wore costumes on stage, it was completely normal. But then I would do I would do jobs where I would be wearing costume amongst people who were not wearing costume in a in a sort of normal environment. And uh, yeah, it was it was 
the first day of that, I was like, oh my God, why is everyone taking a picture? Oh yeah, I remember I'm wearing a five foot wide dress. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and I also think- looks like a velociraptor, you know. <laughs> Love that. I, I also have experienced mostly people, even people who have no idea why I'm in a costume or what it's from, most people are excited and feel positively about seeing something interesting like that. Most people aren't going to be rude or, or weird or they'll be rude by accident by being really interested, you know? A lot of times I'll run into like, uh, you know, some old lady at a park while I'm doing a photo shoot and she'll be like, are you in a play? And you know, they'll, whatever they, whatever they want to believe about why you're in a costume, they're like excited about it because it's something unique and fun. And I think when you're in a costume in a public space, you have a really fun opportunity to just like brighten people's day and just bring a little bit of magic to their like trip to the grocery store or the gas station. If you're swinging by to get Gatorade before your con or whatever, you, you have a chance to really give somebody a memorable moment. Yeah, absolutely. Wordy Girl says, sometimes people take photos of me and stare and I'm not even cosplaying. So yeah, <laughs> a lot of times I forget I look interesting. It happens to me. I People are like, hey, nice hair. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's red. I forgot. <laughs> Does that a natural, A natural redheaded friend of mine and I walked into a grocery store together and someone said, nice hair. And both of us said, thanks, before realizing, oh, you get that all the time too. <laughs> <laughs> right it's a whole thing uh the bonus action says i created a magic dress a while ago with extra dimensional pockets yes, yes. yes. now just make it in real life and i'll buy it put that on kickstarter <laughs> that is what i need like i literally carry around a handbag just so i can fill it full of snacks and water and you know all that random crap books right yes. like that's what's in my handbag it's i have a full set of, of dice in my purse Exactly, right? It's everybody's like, oh, it's full of lady potions and stuff. And I open it up and I'm like, would you like some snacks? Would you like to Do some- you want a like- wrench? Right. Would you like the Pathfinder core book? You know. <laughs> Love that. Oh dear. Okay, so we are very sadly out of time. I need to ask you for your last advice, your last pithy nugget of wisdom for creating costumes and uniforms, especially, of course, for our costumes and uniforms challenge. I really do think that the absolute best thing you can do if you want to dig into designing or just coming up with concepts for clothes is just to do some exploration of the clothes that's already out, clothes that are already out there. Because ultimately, most of us, unless we are involved in an industry or a field where clothing is really important, most of us just sort of take it in passively and don't ever think about it that much. And there are so many people doing so much interesting stuff in fashion and in historical costuming and in clothing in general. There's so many ideas and thoughts out there. And I think the more that you actually choose to intentionally learn about it, the more ideas you're going to have and the more creative that you're going to feel about it. Because ultimately, if you just think about it without doing any research, then like you're going to come up with a lot of things that people have come up with before because that's just like all that you have you're you're working in a very limited space the more that you learn the broader your the whole area you're working in can be and the more exciting it can get yeah absolutely and um any recommendations for where to look for those those kinds of different styles different traditions that kind of stuff so I'm totally stealing this from my friend Kelsey, who um, I actually interviewed for a video that I released this week about character costume design. Um, she's Tough Tink on the internet. She's a designer and cosplayer, and she's amazing. And um, what she suggested to me, which I love, is looking at high fashion and like current runway trends, because runway fashion is always many steps beyond what we're actually wearing. A lot of it looks crazy and you'd never wear it out onto the street because what they're trying to do is not design something for people to wear. They're trying to design something that pushes the boundaries and expectations of fashion in a way that hasn't been done before. And I think that that is an amazing space uh, to find things that haven't been done and things that can feel fantastical in a way that a lot of times our writing, we, we want it to feel out of the ordinary. We want our ideas to feel new and fresh. And that's a place where people who, this is their job, it's their job to think of new, fresh ways to do clothes. So the, the idea of being able to stand on the shoulders of people who are doing that full time and and be inspired by that kind of work, I think is brilliant. And what what Kelsey suggested, which I love, is combining that with Combining that with the historical is a great place to find historical flavored fantasy because fantasy is by nature, you know, beyond the fantastical historical. Right. right exactly. 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 
Okay, so um, our raffle is closed. Sadly, our first winner, Arcane Scrolls, is not here to claim their prize. But uh, Siobhan the writer, congratulations. You have won a Eldritch Foundry figurine. Yes, and you are here. Fantastic. You know what to do. Email me at hello at worldanvil.com to claim your prize, and I will make sure that you get that. Well, Jenny, this has been so much fun. You can tell it's been fun because we've overrun by 15 minutes, which only <laughs> happens when my guests are awesome. Or have to. Or, Thank you, know, you so much. It was a lot of fun. And I would, I would talk for another hour. <laughs> well, be careful saying that because we will get you back to talk about something else if you would be interested. I would love that. Yes, guys, <laughs> what do you want Jenny to come back and talk about? Throw it in the chat and I will make sure that we pick another date and we get Jenny talking about that awesome stuff. Make sure you throw it in the chat right now. In the meantime, we are going on a raid to Arcadian, but just before we do, I have some thank yous. First of all, Jenny, thank you ever so much. Like, just that, it's been so much fun. Folks in the chat, of course, thank you so much for being here, for watching, for joining in. Amazing comments, hilariousness. You can join us Thursday, Friday, Saturday again next week for world building Q&A. You can ask us questions about costuming and uniforms or writing or GMing or playing or whatever you would like. And of course, World Anvil as well. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be, gonna be pretty fun. We don't have a special stream next Saturday, which means next Saturday will be our old style community stream, drinking game, all that good stuff. And uh, who knows, there may even be some singing too. Let's see what happens. Uh, I would of course like to thank everybody who donated today. Bits, my goodness, subs galore, wow. Okay, there's too many to read out. That is absolutely extraordinary. Guys, thank you so very much for your generosity. Thank you everybody who followed us today. Please stick around for the raid, even just to shout out, light up the forge, which is our raid shout. And we will be back next week for another very fine streaming experience. Now, if you would like to grab your hammer, go wild build.